Hello there and welcome back to another slideshow to supplement your chapter for managing learning environments. So as you know, my name is Holly Stevenson and I will be guiding you through this PowerPoint presentation today. My narration is by no means meant to be the sole focus of your studying and your learning with regard to this chapter and it is only meant to supplement both our lecture discussion and your textbook reading as well as your own independent study. So as you know by now I am not from here, hence the accent, um, but I thought it might be worthwhile given that later on we're going to be talking about cultural awareness with regard to your students. So I thought it might be nice to know a little bit more about where I come from. So I am from Dundee, which is a city about the same size as Cedar Rapids on the east coast of Scotland. You can see it here pinpointed on the map. For those of you who are big golfing fans, I am just about a 15 minute drive from St Andrews where they have the old course um, golf course. So that's a little bit about me. I came over to Iowa City about four years ago now to embark on my PhD. So as you will notice, this individual exercise is something that we undertook in class on Thursday. Um, I wanted to remind you of the exercise which we did purely so that you can have some time to reflect on what we learnt by undertaking that exercise and I'd like you to think about why it was a valuable endeavour and the things which you learned and also what it taught you not only about um, different students and how they might behave in problematic ways in the classroom, but also what it taught us about being a teacher and how important it is how teachers respond to students and value students. So here is a slide about custodial teaching, which is something which you should already be fairly familiar with. So I created a little diagram here to try to illustrate the hierarchy which is present when custodial teaching is at play. So it is important for your purposes that you're able to define what custodial teaching is. Um, and what it is comprised of, the methods which it uses, and also to be able to provide examples of instances where a teacher is custodial, when it might be the most appropriate um, teaching style to be using, and when it might not be. And then in contrast to custodial teaching, we have a humanistic teaching approach. So again, you can see here um, my diagram which I've drawn to illustrate a much more um, even playing field when it comes to who is responsible and who takes control in the classroom when humanistic teaching um, is being adopted. Um, so again, it's important for you to understand what humanistic teaching is, be able to define it, be able to compare it to custodial teaching, uh, when it might be an appropriate method to be using, when it might not be, and examples of it at play. 
So we spent a little bit of time in class talking about what the aim of classroom management might be. So we had our four separate aims which we discussed of classroom management and the textbook goes into a significant amount of depth as to what each of them are. Before we get to the four aims of classroom management, I wanted to include this slide so that you could refresh your memories and re-familiarise yourselves with classroom cooperation and its importance, as well as what it means to say that classrooms are multidimensional. On the next slide, you will see that I've included a video from the very first Harry Potter movie, um, and I think it's very relevant and applicable in our discussion of the first aim of classroom management, which is access to learning. So please do watch the video and write down your thoughts about why I decided to include this video in terms of our discussion of access to learning. Incantations in this class. As such, I don't expect many of you to appreciate the subtle science and exact art that is potion making. However, for those select few who possess the predisposition, I can teach you how to bewitch the mind and ensnare the senses. I can tell you how to bottle, fame, brew, glory, and even put a stopper in death. Then again, maybe some of you have come to Hogwarts in possession of abilities so formidable that you feel confident enough to not pay attention. if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? You don't know? Well, let's try again. Where, Mr. Potter, would you look if I asked you to find me a beeswell? I don't know, sir. And what is the difference between monkshood and wolfbane? I don't know, sir. Pity. Clearly, fame isn't everything, is it, Mr. Potter? Clearly, Hermione knows. Seems a pity not to ask her. Silence. So here I have taken the chart which is in your textbook um, and I've applied it here just to illustrate again how much time children are mandated to be in school by the state versus how much time students are in the classroom learning and actually engaged in the task at hand. So again, think about this, think about why this is important and think about, as a teacher, how we might go about trying to remedy the gap which this graph makes apparent. We spoke at length in our lecture about how crucial 
relationships are when it comes to the classroom environment which you cultivate and the learning which you facilitate. On the next slide, I have a video which I think is very effective at demonstrating what it means when we say that the final aim of classroom management is management for self-management and how important it is to foster self-management within your pupils so as to facilitate the most effective learning possible for them. Let's talk about self-management, a set of skills that are critical to kids' success in school and beyond. Self-management has several names and many concepts associated with it. We're also going to talk about it in terms of marshmallows, stop signs, squeezy balls, and teaching. Let's start with the marshmallows. In the late 1960s, a Stanford professor named Walter Michel wanted to gauge young children's ability to delay gratification so he conducted a groundbreaking self-management experiment. He and his researchers took preschool kids and sat them in a room in front of a marshmallow or other treat. The researcher would say, I'm going to leave for 15 minutes. If you'd like to eat the marshmallow, then eat it. If you can wait until I come back, I'll give you a second one and you can eat them both. That's it. That was the whole experiment. Michelle found that despite their best efforts, two-thirds of the kids ate the marshmallow before the researcher came back. In the years since then, the experiment has been copied many times with kids from different communities, ethnicities, and backgrounds in a range of countries all over the world. Typically, two-thirds of the kids eat the marshmallow. Here's where the results of Michelle's experiment get really interesting. After running the experiment a bunch of times in California, his team tracked down all the marshmallow test kits they could find 10 years later, and 20 years, and 30, and 40, and they found some startling results. The kids who were able to wait for the second treat scored better on the SATs, once you control for IQ, were rated as more academically and socially competent by their parents, and had a greater ability to plan, handle stress, and concentrate without becoming distracted, even decades later. There's been a bunch of research that builds on or extends these findings. One larger, more comprehensive study followed a thousand children born in the early 70s in Dunedin, New Zealand. Focusing on self-management, researchers interviewed the children as they grew from 4 to 11. They also gave questionnaires to parents, teachers, and peers. Then they tracked down the original kids when they were in their 30s. They found that the children's ratings on self-management between the ages of 4 and 11 correlated with whether or not they were high school or college graduates, addicted to alcohol or drugs, economically stable or living paycheck to paycheck, involved in criminal activity. All these results lead to one big question. What does this mean for the kids who ate the first marshmallow? For that matter, what does it mean for the kids who don't have self-management between the ages of 4 and 11? Does this mean if the child hasn't developed the right self-management skills early, her whole life path is much worse? Here's what Walter Michel says about this exact issue. We're talking about correlations that are significant. We're not talking about uh, a destiny for an individual. So uh, I want to be very clear that a branding would be completely missing the point, particularly since the most exciting findings about the marshmallow experiments are the ease with which it is possible to change an individual's ability to delay gratification. And there are uh, ways to do that. There are very straightforward ways to do it that connect with how the brain works. The interpretation to be taken from the findings is that this is an enormously important skill. It has predictive uh, qualities. It has protective effects. But it is teachable. It is changeable. In fact, 
Michelle showed that self-management could be taught in an experiment similar to the marshmallow test. In this version, researchers gave the kids helpful ideas before the test. They said, imagine the marshmallow is actually a flat picture, or a cloud, or there is a bug crawling on it. Suddenly the kids could wait far longer. So there are strategies and techniques you can give kids to help them nurture and grow their self-management muscles, many of which can help students in longer lasting, more profound ways. These strategies extend beyond envisioning a situation differently. They involve teaching kids to avoid certain situations, modify their surroundings to reduce distractions, manage their emotions constructively, shift their attention, organize to complete tasks, and plan how to overcome obstacles that may arise. Still, despite growing research on the topic, we're in the early days of learning the best ways to help students build self-management skills. The techniques that work, or even just what to focus on, can vary from student to student in a single class. But one thing we do know is this. Teachers in the classroom and parents at home tend to notice self-management issues the most when something goes wrong. A student who loses track of his assignments and comes to class unprepared. A student who constantly interrupts peers and teachers. A student who fidgets constantly and can't focus in the classroom. This could be any kid, at any age, at any ability level. What adults normally do is see this behavior and tell the student to stop. Stop messing around, you have to do your homework. Stop fidgeting. Or like in Michelle's experiment, don't eat the marshmallow. Now, when you do that, you're basically telling the child you have to stop and you have to figure out how to do it. You just put it all on the child. And the problem is, maybe the child doesn't know how. For whatever reason, they never learned this particular self-management skill. Saying stop doesn't fix that. So what if rather than saying stop, you say, instead of what you're doing now, which isn't working too well, why don't you do this? For that kid who is fidgeting all the time, what if you give him a squeezy ball and say, Squeeze this ball as much as you want because you need to do something with your hands and that will make it easier for you to pay attention in class. Instead of just saying stop or no, you're saying here's a strategy to try. One of the findings of the original marshmallow test is that it's primarily a test of whether a child has learned particular self-management strategies. Kids who stare at the marshmallow and simply try their hardest not to eat it, well, they pretty much always eat it. The kids who have a strategy to shift their attention by singing a song, walking around, putting their forehead on the table, covering their eyes, or any number of things are best able to wait for the second marshmallow. As we now know, shifting attention is one of a broad range of self-management strategies. What works and what to focus on can vary from child to child, but the self-management strategies as a whole are teachable and like muscles, they can be strengthened in all students. So this brings us to routines and procedures versus rules. And again, um, I have inserted um, this nice little diagram, which illustrates not only examples of both procedures and rules, um, proce sorry, procedures and routines versus rules, but it also shows how important it is for a teacher to be making use of both within their classroom, right? And not solely to have rules or solely to have routines and procedures, but to be incorporating a good mix of both within their classroom. So again, think of some rules, think of some routines and procedures, which ones when you've been a student have you thought to be um, beneficial, which ones not so beneficial. As a future teacher, what uh, routines and procedures or which rules would you like to adopt in your classroom?
So, of course, with breaking rules, with transgressing against the routines and procedures which a teacher sets, comes consequences, both as a teacher deciding what the consequences are and also implementing um, punishments when somebody does transgress a rule or a procedure which you have in place. So again, do just reflect on this, um, but we spoke about this in class. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to get in touch. We also spoke a little bit about the importance of where students sit and how that can have a monumental impact on their learning and um, whilst it's something which we might not consider to be um, too crucial in their learning. So we spoke about um, two different ways in which you can organise your classroom. So horizontal rows versus a cluster of four or circle arrangement. So it's important that you're able to both identify what these different arrangements look like, but also come up with examples of when each might be um, appropriate and when you would use the arrangements versus when it might not be um, the best suited uh, table arrangement for your classroom. So the first week of class is very important as the teacher um, for numerous reasons, but setting a precedent is crucial. I cannot stress strongly enough how important it is to set a precedent um, with regard to how you are as a teacher right, right off the bat. So we spoke about the importance of being organized, to be clear in your rules, in your routines and procedures from the beginning and to follow through with consequences if students do transgress. Um, it's important also to have something interesting for students to do right away. So you even saw in my lecture last Thursday, we did the exercise, which we mentioned at the beginning of this PowerPoint presentation. You've got to grab your students' attention right from the bat, get them on board with you. And it's also important to ensure that each student is focused on equally. So simply because, for example, you have a student who is very energetic, very extroverted and chatty and wants to answer every question you pose to the class, it's crucial that you don't, um, you don't avoid engaging this student um, because you don't want that student to become disengaged but it's also important that you don't neglect other students perhaps students who don't feel so confident in the material or simply don't feel so confident in um, reaching out and answering the question and be human crack a joke um obviously if it's not in your personality to constantly be cracking jokes then i i don't recommend you do it's important to be yourself, but we're all human. We all make mistakes. When things don't go well, it's important to just say, hey, put my hand up, I've messed up, but don't worry, we're gonna sort it. So we spoke about with itness with regard to prevention. So it's important that you know what with itness is and how we might implement with itness. So we have um, the importance of avoiding timing errors and the importance of avoiding target errors. Um, if you feel that you need more clarity as to what both of these concepts are, then do refer to your textbook or get in touch with me, but they are important concepts for you to know. Here's some more concepts which are important, group focus, overlapping, movement management so again important to know what all of these are be able to define them and have examples of how you might implement all of these notions in your classroom
So caring relationships in the classroom are so crucial to effective learning and a safe learning environment. So on the next slide, you will see a TED Talk video, which I think is very good at demonstrating in a very clear and relatable manner how important it is for kids to like the people who are teaching them and how monumental an impact it can have on them to know that the person who is guiding their learning thinks of them as a real person and really values and cares about them as an individual. So please do watch that video. I have spent my entire life either at the schoolhouse, on the way to the schoolhouse, or talking about what happens in the schoolhouse. Both my parents were educators, my maternal grandparents were educators, and for the past 40 years I've done the same thing. But one of the things that we never discuss or we rarely discuss is the value and importance of human connection relationships. James Comer says that no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. George Washington Carver says all learning is understanding relationships. Everyone in this room has been affected by a teacher or an adult. For years, I have watched people teach. I have looked at the best and I've looked at some of the worst. A colleague said to me one time, they don't pay me to like the kids. They pay me to teach a lesson. The kids should learn it. I should teach it. They should learn it. Case closed. Well, I said to her, you know, kids don't learn from people they don't like. <laughs> she said, that's just a bunch of hooey. And I said to her, well, your year is going to be long and arduous, dear. <laughs> Needless to say, it was. Some people think that you can either have it in you to build a relationship or you don't. I think Stephen Covey had the right idea. He said you ought to just throw in a few simple things, like seeking first to understand as opposed to being understood. Simple things like apologizing. You ever thought about that? Tell a kid you're sorry, they're in shock. I taught a lesson once on ratios. I'm not real good with math, but I was working on it. <laughs> and I got back and looked at that teacher edition. I taught the whole lesson wrong. <laughs> so I came back to class the next day and I said, look, guys, I need to apologize. I taught the whole lesson wrong. I'm so sorry. I said, that's okay, Ms. Pearson. You were so excited. We just let you go. <laughs> For years, I watched my mother take the time at recess to review, go on home visits in the afternoon, buy combs and brushes and peanut butter and crackers to put in her desk drawer for kids that needed to eat and a washcloth and some soap for the kids who didn't smell so good. See, it's hard to teach kids who stink. <laughs> and kids can be cruel. And so she kept those things in her desk and years later, after she retired, I watched some of those same kids come through and say to her, you know, Miss Walker, you made a difference in my life. You made it work for me. You made me feel like I was somebody when I knew at the bottom I wasn't. And I want you to just see what I've become. And when my mama died two years ago at 92, there were so many former students at her funeral. It brought tears to my eyes, not because she was gone, but because she left a legacy of relationships that could never disappear. Here you will see um, a little snapshot of some of my own teaching evaluations from one semester which I taught here. Um, as a disclaimer, I am not adding uh, these in here um, to gloat in any way or anything like that. What I would like you to do is I would like you to think about why I decided to highlight the parts which I did and also to think about any recurring themes which are apparent. What do students seem to be motivated to talk about? What do they seem to care about? 
versus what are they not mentioning here at all, which might be surprising to some of you. So this is something we will spend some time in class discussing, so do think about this um, and do write down some answers um, to prompt discussion. We spoke again in class and your textbook um, has this diagram of the hierarchy of behaviours. So we have democracy at the bottom, we have cooperation, then bossing, bullying and anarchy at the top. So at the very bottom there, bottom not to mean it's the worst, but bottom to mean that it's a much more even playing field where everybody um, is responsible for their own actions, self-disciplined, and as we go up the pyramid and we get to anarchy at the top, it's purely kind of everyone for themselves um, and the environment has transcended into an aimless chaos. So here are three examples um, of things which might occur in school um, and I would like you to attribute one of the levels of hierarchy to each of these examples and then we will discuss in class why you went with what you did and what is indeed correct. Of course, being well versed in bullying and cyberbullying and the different forms which bullying might take in the classroom is so crucial. Um, so it's important to know what bullying is versus what cyberbullying is. Communication. So communication is key in teaching and we have some phrases here, some um, concepts which um, it's important you know. So we have the paraphrasing rule, the empathetic listening, I messages and assertive discipline. So please do brush up on these concepts so that you feel confident in identifying them and defining them yourself. The importance of being culturally responsive in our teaching is monumental. And so in our lecture, we spoke about how there are some things which appear almost too simple and straightforward to do, but they're often overlooked by teachers, yet they have such an impact on making students who are perhaps um, not from the area which you're teaching in, to feel more connected and included within your classroom environment.
thank you for making it to the end of this quite long and lengthy PowerPoint presentation. Um, have a wonderful weekend, take care, and as always, if you have any further questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to email me. I am happy to help and always at the end of my email. I'm always, always on my email. So my email address as always is here. Thanks again for listening and I will see you in class.